Hello, everyone, and welcome to the final event in Metcalf Institute's 24th annual public lecture series. My name is Sunshine Menezes. I'm Metcalf Institute's Executive Director, and we're joining you today from the traditional homelands of the Narragansett people who have stewarded this land and adjacent coastal waters for thousands of years. The University of Rhode Island's Metcalf Institute has been advancing informed public conversations about science and the environment since 1998. We approach this holistically, offering science training for professional journalists, communication training for scientists and other communicators, and public events like this one. We also founded the Inclusive SciComm Symposium, which brings together researchers, educators, and practitioners from across the country to make science communication more inclusive, equitable, and intersectional. The next Inclusive SciComm Symposium will be held virtually this October, and we urge you to learn more about that by visiting the link in the chat. Over the course of this week, we've heard from experts in science, journalism, and policy. And while their, their various insights, of course, vary, the through line is an effort to center equitable approaches to the climate crisis. And as we've heard over and over, there is no time for delay. Earlier this year, a huge swath of North America from Canada to Northern Mexico experienced a dip in the polar vortex that produced extreme cold weather because of regulatory decisions that left Texas power infrastructure ill-prepared for this weather, at least 111 people died and residents lost power for an average of 42 hours with a cascading series of effects on people's physical and mental health and well-being. Today, people in the Western US are experiencing a record-breaking heat wave that will worsen air quality, the existing mega drought and the risks of wildfire. These events, which are driven by climate change, are no longer rare. NOAA's National Centers for Environmental Information report that the annual average of extreme weather events with losses of $1 billion or more was 7.1 events from 1980 to 2020. The annual average for the most recent five years, 2016 to 2020, is 16.2 events. In 2020 alone, the US experienced 22 of these billion dollar disasters, shattering the previous record of 16 events in 2011 and 2017. Clearly, our electricity and broader energy systems need to be adjusted now, not later. And as this rapidly changing energy sector uh, transitions in response to climate change, we must ensure equitable energy solutions, ones that account for the inherent differences in energy availability and security for vulnerable communities that are already facing energy poverty. Today's panel will explore some of the questions involved with this transition. So now I'm thrilled to introduce the moderator for this panel discussion, Ezra David Romero. Ezra is an award-winning climate reporter with KQED News, where he has an entire beat dedicated to covering the absence and excess of water from drought to flooding to sea level rise. Though he's based in Sacramento, you may have heard his reporting on national public radio shows such as Morning Edition, All Things Considered, and Science Friday. He also contributes to other outlets like Palabra, the web magazine published by the National Association of Hispanic Journalists. Ezra is truly a multimedia reporter, producing podcasts, photography, radio, and films. And I'm especially proud to note that he is an alum of Metcalf Institute's annual science immersion workshop for journalists. So with that, welcome Ezra. Hey, it's really great to be here and thanks for um, having me. And the, the fellowship was awesome a couple of years ago. I learned so much and it impacted my reporting every day. Today, we're gonna have three panelists. The first is Dominic Bednar. He's a PhD candidate in environment and sustainability at the University of Michigan, who is defending his work next week. He studies energy justice broadly and energy poverty or vulnerability. More specifically, he's a Fulbright scholar and was named a Forbes under 30 scholar. He is also, he also co-founded People of the Global Majority for the Environment. It's a group that creates spaces where people who identify as the people of the global majority can gain skills and mentorship needed for success as leaders in environmental sectors. We'll also be joined by Nikkei Adeyeye. She's the Western States Energy Manager and Senior Analyst at Union of Concerned Scientists. She works mostly in California, but also Washington and Oregon on advancing clean energy policy, especially via regulatory changes and grid operations. Her past roles have included Chief of Staff to Commissioner Martha Guzman at the California Utilities Commission, 
where she worked to advocate for better clean air and energy policy with environmental organizations and community groups across California. She also currently sits on the board of directors for the Center for Energy Efficiency and Renewable Technologies. Well, lastly, we'll be joined by Aaron Ng. He's a program analyst with the US Department of Energy where he manages the Energy Transitions Initiative or ETI projects. The ETI program aims to advance self-reliant island and remote communities through the development of resilient energy systems. He previously worked as a speechwriter, legislative aide, and a correspondent in the United States Senate and as a Harold W. Rosenthal Fellow for the Office of the Secretary of Defense. During his time at the U.S. Department of Energy, he, had, he has managed the development of a multi-million dollar platform that integrates data-driven energy planning in areas of renewable energy, energy efficiency, and sustainable transportation. To kick off our presentations today, we're going to hear from Dominic Bednar. He's going to discuss his research findings about how people struggle with energy poverty at a national scale and give us suggestions for how to develop a national system that would track these concerns rather than the patchwork systems that exist currently. It's really nice to have you here, Dominic. Um, take it away. Thank you for that introduction, Ezra. And hello, hello, everyone. Just give me a moment while I share my screen. And you all should be good now to see. Um, so again, my name is Dominic Bednar, and today I am really excited to share with you all about my work on um, energy poverty recognition and response in the United States. And before I get started, I want to do a land acknowledgement to note that I'm on the ancestral lands of the Anishinaabe, uh, Waki, Potawatomi, and the Peoria, um, also known as Detroit, Michigan. And so to start, millions of Americans um, often find themselves forgoing food or medicine, often facing utility disconnect. Um, many of them can't comfortably regulate com um, temperatures in their home. Either their home is too hot or too cold. And <clears throat> many more folks actually have um, broken heating or cooling equipment. Each of these are what we call situations of energy insecurity, which really help us characterize um, residential energy poverty in the United States. What's shattering is that um, African-Americans or black folks are twice as likely to be behind on their utility bills and three times as likely to experience a, a utility shutoff. Um, this disproportionate impact um, affects marginalized communities such as low income, um, Latinx, Native Americans and indigenous folks, as well as uh, elderly populations as well. And so speaking to the gravity of this issue and how it particularly affects um, varying groups of people. And so today I wanna to talk about this problem that we have with how we actually define and characterize energy poverty and think about also um, our mechanisms for how we actually solve it. And so thinking about how we measure this problem and consequently, how do we evaluate the problem? And so the crux of my, my argument or for this part of my research um, really looks at if we don't effectively have a definition that helps us characterize the amount, the extent, and causes of energy poverty in the US, it will inevitably misguide how we measure this problem and consequently misinform how we evaluate our solutions to this problem, um, which ultimately will lead us to path-dependent solutions, which said another way, it's kind of doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And so path-dependent being that we've taken a number of, or made a number of decisions along this path, and it's a little difficult to course correct and so today I'll be talking about, one, the performance measures, um, but also the program evaluations for um, two core responses that I would use as a case study that we have to energy poverty in the U.S. Um, those two core responses are housed in the Department of Health and Human Services, as well as the Department of Energy. Um, the Department of Health and Human Services has a bill assistance program whereby if you fall behind in your utility bills, you're able to actually um, you know, get some assistance to help pay your energy bill. Um, the weatherization program does just that. It helps weatherize your home, helps retrofit it such that it's actually energy efficient. And so um, how we actually define folks to be energy poverty is if you meet these criteria, these eligibility criteria. How we measure the success of the program is whether or not we distribute these resources to these groups of people 
and or for the um, weatherization program, do we actually weatherize these homes? Um, and finally, there aren't any national program evaluations to understand the effectiveness for the um, bill assistance program. However, there are a number of um, national evaluations that have happened for the weatherization program that demonstrate the effectiveness insofar as um, its operations, its cost effectiveness, as well as non-energy benefits. Here I show these, uh, really the disparity in funding that goes towards these two programs. And as you see with the orange graph, um, we've sizably funded more dollars with the bill assistance program over the weatherization program up until this point during the Obama era um, stimulus plan to kind of help us get out of that recession. Um, and so this helps us showcase to understand that um, our primary response to energy poverty is actually bill assistance. When we know that energy efficiency has demonstrated more effective responses in so far as keeping people's temperatures comfortable as well as reducing overall energy burden, which is the percent that a household spends on their um, energy expenditure of their household income. And so what we really need to do is move towards a multidimensional understanding of energy poverty through this concept of energy vulnerability. And so I characterize it um, as this pipe going from the power plant to the home, but having these leaks in the pipe. And so these technical characteristics, um, we're kind of losing some energy through the dwelling characteristics or how the um, building performs, socioeconomic characteristics, such as how many people live in the house, does the race, gender, of the head of household matter. Um, and then also considering the environmental policy dimensions to through which um, varying, different, varying states have different responses and different understandings of energy policy. Um, and so ultimately taking all of those to really understand through a framework of risk assessment. So how do all of these factors um, increase the risk that ultimately threaten and harm our most treasured assets? And so in closing, um, I have this AAA saves the day, which is really a, a principled argument of access to adequate and affordable energy, which really interrogates this process of how do we define this problem such that we can better target um, who is most vulnerable, who needs help? How do we better assess the problem to understand the extent that people are experiencing energy poverty? And finally, how do we evaluate our solutions to understand how effective they are? And with that, thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Dominic, for sharing all that. Just a follow-up question, you know, so you work at this federal level, you know, nationally, looking at, looking at this happening nationally. What gaps do you see nationally around energy policy for low-income people or people of color? You know, are there, do you have any thoughts on how to close those gaps? Yeah, I think for me, I'm, I'm always a big proponent of how do we meet people where they are? And so, in what ways can we do more targeted assessments to understand, like, what type of energy inefficiencies people have, or also like what uh, sizable bill problems are um, folks experiencing. And so a lot of times like that's kind of regulated through public utility commissions, but that doesn't really help us out if, you know, we have a good group of the population that are um, powered by municipalities or cooperatives. And so um, I think there's, there's room for us to innovate and think about how we might, um, you know, work with people to figure out how like where the problems actually are. Gotcha. So if anyone has questions during this time for any of our panelists, um, feel free to put them in the chat and we'll, we'll either ask them during the presentation or in the Q&A at the end. Our next presentation is by Nike Adeyeye, who will start, who will share on the ground examples of the challenges, opportunities, and trade-offs that the state of California is facing as it pursues this energy transition. That is how to craft a regulatory structure at the state level that addresses the wicked problems and overlapping challenges of meeting climate goals, protecting people from wildfire risk and power outages, and ensuring equitable, reliable, and renewable energy systems. I met Nike a few years ago in an interview when she was with another organization, and we both live here in California dealing with wildfires and shutoffs and all this kind of stuff, this heat wave we're in right now. Um, welcome, Nike. Thank you. Thanks, Ezra. And thank you, Sunshine. Thanks, everyone, for spending a little bit of your morning with us. Um, I'm going to talk about, yeah, what we're in the thick of right now. It's extremely hot in my open apartment because um, we do not have AC really in the day. And um, like Ezra said, my name is Nike. I work at the Union of Concerned Scientists. I'm in Oakland, California, which is a lonely, a lonely land. And I'm just going to, you know, talk about our 
our transition and how we're dealing with all these crises right now. Um, California really prides itself on being a clean energy leader and, and we definitely are, um, but our state is, is really far from perfect. Um, we are, when I started to write this talk, I thought we are heading into a summer that is going to be hot and dry, but we are in a summer that is likely to be very hot and dry. Um, and that raises concerns about the reliability of our grid in the face of extreme heat, as well as wildfire risk. Um, and we're also facing an affordability crisis, like Dominic talked about, um, utility shutoff protections um, in California have existed throughout the pandemic, um, preventing people from getting their power shut off, but that's ending at the end of this month. And California's electricity rates are steadily climbing, due in part to costs associated with um, preventing utility sparked wildfires. So the challenge we're facing is how does the state respond to these climate change fueled energy crises in a way that's aligned with its climate and public health goals, but also while making sure energy is affordable for everyone. Um, so first let's just talk about how California is keeping the lights on even during extreme heat. Um, last August, California experienced the heat wave that led to rolling blackouts and state agencies found that the rolling blackouts happened because of three main factors. The first was extreme heat that led to an unexpected surge in energy demand. The second was more limited supply in the early evening hours. And there were sudden forced outages of natural gas plants leading up to the start of rolling blackouts, which were partially due to extreme heat, just causing the plants to have malfunctions. And then there are practices in the energy markets that made accurate scheduling of the resources difficult. So since last fall, the state agencies have been working through public processes that UCS and other you know, organizations have been part of to figure out how to address these issues so the power stays on during the summer and subsequent summers. And unfortunately for this summer, despite California's commitment to decarbonizing its grid, the solutions do partially rely on fossil fuels. Um, so the state's going to allow utilities to procure additional resources. Some are going to be from renewable and clean energy sources, but some will be from existing power plants, natural gas power plants through efficiency upgrades or partially repowering um, old gas plants. So um, also last summer, the governor issued an executive order during uh, that time when rolling blackouts were a threat that was designed to free up electricity from the grid by allowing commercial and industrial customers to use their backup power. So it let companies run diesel backup generators um, and it also allowed ships docked at ports to get off of the power from the grid and instead burn fossil fuels to keep their power running on board. And um, that has major implications for communities that are near these sources. For diesel backup generation, a lot of companies that have that um, capability in their, on their facilities are near schools or near residential neighborhoods. And for ports, ports you know, are near communities like in, in Southern California, especially that are um, low income, communities of color typically disadvantaged and face a higher burden of pollution already. So allowing more pollution in those places compounds the inequity that those communities are facing. And actually yesterday, Governor Newsom signed a similar executive order for this week for this heat wave that we're in just to make sure that all possible power is available. Um, so we're, we're facing real issues that actually, you know, harm public health in especially in impacted communities. Um, so the, the question really is like, what can the state do to address reliability, but also protect public health and stay true to the, you know, climate change laws that we have on the books in California. And um, one thing is that rather than directing utilities to get more power from gas plants specifically, the state could direct utilities to get power that meets certain attributes and while, while also complying with state climate and clean air policy. So getting resources that can meet the demand in the early evening hours when there's, that's the, the critical period right now on our grid or resources that can provide that base load kind of always running power that natural gas often provides but without emitting those pollutants. And thankfully that's starting to be reflected in some of the, the planning that um, the utility, that the, the agencies are doing. Uh, for example, the California Independent System Operator is planning for large increases in the amount of battery storage as a key tool to improve reliability in the you know, near term and midterm, and then is also expecting four times the amount of battery storage to be online this summer as compared to last summer. So those are good steps, but there's still a lot of work to be done to move the state away from relying on fossil fuels. And this would also be a really great time to listen to communities that are most impacted by extreme heat and the emissions that come from those polluting gas plants. So 
Um, in California, there's an EJ organization, environmental justice organization, the California Environmental Justice Alliance, that has proposed a program that would compensate low-income households for reducing their energy use when energy demand is high. And so far, that has not been taken up. That proposal has not been evaluated by our um, California Public Utilities Commission, but they um, now have moved from declining to evaluate it to considering it in a, a future proceeding this summer. So that's a positive step. Um, and then just briefly, I wanna talk a little bit about the affordability crisis that um, California is facing. Like I said, our, our moratorium on utility shutoffs ends at the end of this month and our rates and our bills are increasing. Um, and customers already um, throughout this pandemic have accrued utility debts that exceed $2 billion in California. So any increases are going to result in significant consequences for low-income households. Um, I just wanted to point this out that um, our, our California Public Utilities Commission did an analysis of rates and costs and actually found that one of the ways to help the state um, make bills more affordable overall for households is actually wide, more widespread electrification. Because if you electrify homes and increase the use of electric vehicles, that translates to overall savings because people aren't spending as much on gasoline or natural gas. And those price increases are more volatile than electricity price increases. Um, but that brings up huge issues of access because right now we're not really prioritizing getting electric vehicles and getting you know, solar and storage and all of that into low-income households, especially into you know, the household of renters. And most low-income um, households in California rent their homes. So there are a lot of areas where California has the space to, to grow and to improve and how it addresses reliability and climate change and affordability. And when we do keep all those, these things in mind, there are solutions that can work like you know, more widespread electrification for low-income households. So with that, I will turn it back over to Ezra. Hey, Nika. Yeah, so we were both in here in California and we've seen the skies thicken with smoke and turn red in the past couple of years. And, you know, fire season's already started this year. We've had fires in, in Los Angeles, some in Santa Cruz area, you know, very close to where we live in Oakland, San Francisco. Um, but the thing is, fires and heat waves, like, they exacerbate existing inequities for people, right? People who don't have AC, people who don't have the funds to think about climate change. You know, when it comes to like, California's climate policy, how can we rethink it so it's affecting or helping the people who are most affected by extreme heat or wildfire, you know, like, because these people aren't thinking about climate change, right? Because they're looking to meet their basic needs. Is, is there a flipping that needs to happen in some of our thinking here in California from this like bottom up or what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think that there definitely needs to be more bottom up approaches. And I do think people are thinking about climate change. It's just, it is becoming a more urgent priority. So people are thinking about it in terms of the fact that they're thinking about they have to go out to work in this heat or, you know, they have to, yeah. farm workers are working in this heat and it's, you know, a hundred plus in the valley. And so I think people are thinking about climate change and seeing how it affects their lives, especially now, especially in California. And policymakers just need to do a better job of actually getting those people into the conversations. Um, I was part of a, a process at the CPUC when I worked there where we went out to different communities in the Central Valley and asked people like, what do you want to see in terms of your energy changes? Um, and you know, do you want more natural gas? Do you want electrification? Do you, how do you wanna deal with that? And you get really interesting, insightful answers. So it's just, I think it's just that we're not having the right people in the conversation. Yeah, when you have the people who are living with the impacts, right, they have a different answer and it's more, I, in my own reporting, I find that it, it's tangible. Like we need X, Y, and yeah. Z because our lives are suffering in X, Y, and Z ways. So thank you so much, Nikkei, for your time. And we'll, get, we'll answer some questions for me from you in, in, the, in the near future. If you have questions, please put them in the chat and we will either answer them in the chat or in the Q&A later on. Lastly, we're gonna hear from Aaron Ng. He's going to discuss DOE's energy justice efforts and provide an overview of ETI and its Energy Transition Initiative Partnership Project, which works in partnership with remote and island communities to transform their energy systems and address vulnerabilities. Hey Aaron, thanks for joining us. Let's, um, off to you. Thanks Ezra. Um, just gonna take a second to get my slides up on the screen. Are they looking good? Can't see them yet. Are they are they coming up though? No, there's we don't see your screen at all right now. I thought I solved this. 
<laughs> One second. There it is. With without notes. With notes. With notes. I keep thinking I see, see, solve this, and then it keeps messing up. I apologize. It's Zoom life. It's okay. We're all we're all used to it. Better now. Still. Oh yes, there it is. Great. All right. Hi, everyone. Marinating with the U.S. Department of Energy, or DOE for short. I uh, just want to thank the Metcalf Institute for inviting me to speak on this panel today. I want to thank you all for your time. It's an honor to really follow some of those great presentations that we just heard from. I look forward to that discussion. But before we take questions, I just want to give a brief overview of some of the ongoing work at DOE and how we approach energy justice. I'll begin with a survey of those efforts and then really drill in on the Energy Transitions Initiative, or ETI, which is a growing effort at DOE. I'll then talk about one of ETI's projects, the Energy Transitions Initiative Partnership Project, or ETIP. Uh, and I hope that this discussion demonstrates how the federal government has worked and continues to work and improve our approach to address energy issues related to energy justice. So to just start at a very high level, DOE maintains uh, the following priorities. First, combating climate change. Second, creating clean energy union jobs. And while all of these are related or interrelated, um, we also have a huge focus on promoting energy justice. As you know, for far too long, communities of color and low-income communities have borne the brunt of pollution to the resources they rely on to live and raise their families. The clean energy revolution must therefore lift up these communities that have been left behind and make sure those who have suffered the most are the first to benefit. And that's why we have uh, the new uh, DOE Office of Economic Impact and Diversity leading this effort through a new role committed to implementing President Biden's Justice 40 initiative. And just as an example of some of the work that they've already started to do is the Energy Justice Dashboard Beta, which is a pilot data visualization tool that displays DOE specific investments in communities across the country experiencing disproportionately high and inverse uh, economic, human health, climate related, environmental, and other cumulative impacts. And while uh, as I mentioned, um, we have the Office of Economic Impact and Diversity. We also have other um, tools, projects, programs, and initiatives uh, that you can see listed here. Um, this is just a sample, but there's certainly more that I could talk about, but just wanna give something that's a little representative. Um, I already mentioned the Ju Energy Justice Dashboard that the Office of Economic Impact and Diversity uh, is building. Uh, that office is also working with the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy to uh, learn about um, current barriers and actions through a request for information or RFI. And that uh, RFI really seeks to understand how DOE's funding opportunities and innovation and entrepreneurship activities can become more inclusive, just, and equitable in line with the administration's climate goals. Won't go into um, some of these too much, but we also have um, the low income energy affordability data tool, the National Community Solar Partnership, and as Dominic mentioned, the weatherization assistance program. And lastly, we have ETI, which I'll dive into more now. Um, so in general, ETI works with climate vulnerable and energy burdened communities to facilitate their clean energy transitions and to become more self-reliant. Our mission emphasizes the importance of engaging communities because only with community buy-in can we understand priorities and work with them to meet individual community goals. And when we engage with the community, we understand that working towards an energy transition will take a considerable amount of time. And that leads to the ultimate goal of this engagement, 
and what will ensure self-reliance is to build capacity in these communities so they can continue to operate and maintain their clean energy systems. To optimize our investments, the strategies and resources that we develop for these communities are meant to also be replicated to others in need. And so this ETI model has driven our work and is captured in what we call the Energy Transitions Playbook, which I encourage you to look up if you're planning an energy transition. Um, and just one more note about ETI as an initiative. Um, broadly, we also work, um, conduct some place-based re disaster recovery work in um, some of uh, disaster stricken areas like Puerto Rico, the US Virgin Islands, and the Northern Mariana Islands. But um, ETI's tenants are also uh, represented in ETIP, the partnership project I mentioned earlier. From Alaska to Maine, from the Pacific to the Caribbean, communities are prioritizing energy transitions, sustainable strategies for living in harmony with the rugged environments that have supported and challenged residents for generations. Remote island and island communities are absorbing the nation's highest energy costs and are extremely vulnerable to energy disruptions, natural disasters, and climate change impacts. And just as an example, I was supposed to be on a call with the Virgin Islands earlier today, and unfortunately, we weren't, they weren't able to make it because of an island-wide out outage on one of their islands. But while each community is tackling a specific set of problems dictated by local and regional conditions, all are pursuing high-impact technological solutions to ramp up their resilience, often with limited resources and capacity. So ETIP aims to bridge that gap by offering resources and on the ground support for remote island and islanded communities seeking to enhance, enhance their energy infrastructure and mitigate their risk. And this graphic uh, further represents how we deliver assistance to these communities. And as I've mentioned, as part of the ETI framework, the first part of any of our work is understanding community priorities. Instead of the government telling these communities what to do, we want to listen and learn about the community's challenges and goals. Then we work to overcome these challenges and achieve these goals in tandem with the community. It's this understanding of community needs and the partnership approach that delivers the capacity, resources, plans, and ultimately the development of a resilient, cost-effective clean energy system. And I know um, I'm running up on time and certainly want to get to questions, but just want to dive in a little more on, into our partnership approach with uh, ETIP. So to develop our first cohort, which we announced in April, we competitively sought a network of experienced organizations to work collaboratively alongside communities pursuing energy transitions. First, to understand community energy and infrastructure challenges and opportunities and also to identify and advance strategic tailored te technological solutions designed to strengthen resilience postures and reduce economic risk. We chose these organizations based on their experiences and proven record of serving the local communities in their regions. This network utilizes the technical assets of the national labs, builds on the tools developed by DOE, and works alongside competitively selected communities to address energy and infrastructure challenges, build capacity to implement solutions and accelerate the sharing of best practices and innovations. And here's just a snapshot of the 11 communities that we selected in our first cohort in April. And with ETIP's inclusive and empowering cross-cutting approach to building energy resilience in underserved communities, DOE hopes to tailor and scale this project to more communities in need across the country. After all, it is with the Energy Transitions Initiative Framework and ETIP's partnership approach that DOE in part hopes to achieve energy justice, reduce energy burdens, and ensure energy resilient communities across the nation. Again, I want to thank you all for your time. Um, thanks to the panelists for giving such great presentations. And back to you, Ezra. Yeah, thanks, Aaron, for all this. I just want to ask for an example, you know, because a lot of these big ideas around energy justice take a lot of time to unfurl, right? Because these communities are dealing with historic and systematic racism and communities where the infrastructure isn't built or it's not built out at all. Um, how does how does your de group deal with this? And do you have any examples of like you know how how you're working with one of these communities? Yeah. So one of our I think our best success stories was working with um, just Hawaii as a state and the many communities that are in need within Hawaii. And we've been there for 
for about over a decade now. And I think what that shows is a, you need longstanding engagement. Um, you need community buy-in, you need buy-in from all levels of government. And so we, so while, while I say we, we, work, we have worked with them for over a decade and I'd say there's a success story, the success is really theirs. And that's kind of the mantra we wanna um, take in that they're the ones doing the work and ultimately delivering results. We're there to, to, to just guide them. And what you said earlier, what it takes is establishing these relationships, really going in and being there for the long haul and seeing it all the way through. And that's what we're starting with ETIP. And that's why we've also um, employed these, these regional partners who have been working in these communities for a long time to continue doing good work and to continue developing these energy transitions to really reach um, the communities in need. Nice. So at 1.45 or 10.45 where I'm at, we're going to start taking some audience questions. So fill up the chat box with your questions and we will do our best to answer them. And then we'll, we're going to have for the next five minutes or so, we'll answer some more questions that I'm having. And we're happy to take some of your questions as well. Um, so I guess we just want to start off with the idea that around is access to energy and electricity a basic right and why? I think more the why, like who wants to answer that? Dominic, you're smiling. <laughs> uh, sure. So is access to basic electricity a human right? I think it should be. I think technically I don't think so. I mean, it's not, you know, within the United Nations Declaration of, of Human Rights. Um, I think a lot of times like we like to think about water as a human right and try to draw these parallels from water to energy, though energy is a bit more complicated because it comes in a number of different forms. And so the question is, is it a right to all types of energy um, or is it really a right to access to energy? Um, and in that right to access to energy, do we include um, the right to, to produce that energy, the right to store that energy, and the right to, you know, even share that energy. And so presently, I don't think so, but I think that is really the, the, the impetus to a lot of my work is to really provide an evidence base to ultimately, um, you know, support energy as a basic human right. Because it powers a number of things like water sanitation, it powers things like air conditioning, it powers things like electricity to keep um, medicine like refrigerated. And so like when we think about all the, um, the, the goods and, and resources that we need to um, energy for, um, I think it makes a lot of sense to, to move in that direction. Nikkei, did you want to add to that? Yeah, just, I was going to say, I mean, I think it, I agree that it's not technically, you know, a human right, but the right to health, I feel like is so closely tied to, you know, the right to energy that uh, the health, right to health is so closely tied to energy that I feel like you kind of have to think about it as a, a, a human right, at least I think in our U.S. context, I feel like it, it should be, it needs to be just because of refrigeration for medicine and all these kinds of things. Nikkei, this next question is for you. We talked a little bit about earlier and, and yesterday in our pre-chat about direct debt utility relief for people in California because of the COVID crisis, something around like $2 billion from California is going to help people with their debt. Do you think this is the right approach, you know, having the state directly relieving people's debt? And it kind of goes to the previous question around electricity or energy being a human right and doing what we can to help everyone have their lights on and their, their ACs on and things like that. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's a tricky question. I think on the one hand, we do, the government subsidizes things that it wants to encourage. So even now, um, one of the posts that I um, asked folks to share is from a colleague of mine, Joe Daniel, about how we subsidize um, fossil fuel investments still at the federal level. And why not subsidize people's access to energy when that has such a fundamental impact on your day-to-day -day life? So I think that there can be a place for it. Ideally, obviously, you wouldn't want to just rely on that all the time. But I think given the crisis that we're in right now, I think it definitely has a place. I'm glad that California is doing it. And, and another piece that I asked to be shared is, is saying actually that even though California is investing $2 billion in, in debt relief, 
there is more than $2 billion of combined water and energy um, utility debt. So even more could be done. Yeah, you know, we've talked about, all of you have sort of alluded to that there's these gaps out there around energy and energy justice or injustice, I should say. Like, how do we move from this current energy system that we have right now? One that like, you know, there's, we talk about how it focuses on justice, but, but not really. How do, we, how do we go there? How do we transition um, this world of energy to focus on justice? Aaron? Yeah, so um, at least one of the administration's goals is, and what I mentioned earlier is the Justice 40 initiative. And that has been um, a new initiative that we're starting off to really try and di direct our federal investments towards, uh, towards un disadvantaged communities, those that are, um, have traditionally been underserved. And that, that benchmark, I I'd say it's part of the name 40, uh, it's 40% of federal bene uh, the benefits from federal investments to these disadvantaged communities. Um, I know some programs such as ours, where we're trying to think about making, uh, trying to find that maximum benefit for uh, communities. But we're we're certainly learning. There's 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 a large there's a huge learning curve. There's always ways to improve our approach, and that's why, as I mentioned, also we have that RFI out to understand barriers and um, ways to lower the barriers to entry to some of these federal investments so they can really reach those disadvantaged and traditionally underserved communities. The next question is around, can you guys tell us about some examples where communities that really have been innovating on their own around energy justice solutions? Maybe there's partnerships going on. And if there aren't, you should just say there aren't, this is not happening, but are communities holding space on this issue? Aaron, you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I'd say I'd say there are some there there are communities. I, I think the communities we work with in ETI they're they're seeking to address energy justice. Um, I know our, in our recovery work in the USBI, we've talked about aiming benefits of of the work there towards low and moderate income uh, households, communities, um, really seeking those benefits. Uh, elsewhere, there, there's certainly a lot of motivation, um, but again, I'd, I'd harken back to that these, these, some of these communities, while some could be low capacity, some might have higher capacity, really we want to start targeting those lower capacity communities that um, previously weren't able to uh, seize, uh, seize upon these benefits, seize upon these investments, and start working with them to reduce energy burdens and um, costs of the electricity. Nikkei or um, Dominic, do you have any examples? I don't have any examples, actually. I do think that this is an area where there needs to be more. I mean, there definitely are examples in California, but I think this is an area where there needs to be more community-based and targeted work, especially to avoid the stuff like where we're burning diesel to try to make sure we have enough energy to get through this heat wave. So I feel like there is more space for, for more community partnerships. Yeah, I agree. I think definitely we need more space for, for communities, but I think it's also important for us to honor, you know, like the work that communities are doing. And so like, obviously, like, I don't know all of things that communities are doing across the country, um, but if there's a way for us to uplift and elevate um, the existing work people are doing, it's, it's really important. Um, and so I know uh, here in Detroit, uh, Family First Solar, like they are, you know, like organizing um, as an employee-owned co-op to really, you know, get solar out for folks, as well as Solidarity there in Highland Park. Um, but then also the Michigan Environmental Justice Coalition, like they're doing a lot of organizing um, to, you know, really help put, push forward for energy justice um, and organizing like against, or not against, but like with the Michigan Public Service Commission about um, how they might be able to um, help out with bill assistance or, um, especially when it came down to the COVID crisis and thinking about energy moratoriums and shutoffs and things of that nature. Um, nice. But nice. overall, I think, Go say ahead. one more time. Go ahead. Uh, I was gonna say overall, I think, you know, like the, the power of organizing is, is just really important. Ultimately, when we think about the energy transition and um, it's been successful thus far, but there's still a lot more work to go. So we're gonna take some questions now from, from the list from listeners or people who are viewing this. 
I say listeners, I work in radio. Um, so in doing this work, what has been the most surprising thing you have seen or figured out this questions from Kim? Anything surprise you all about the work you're currently doing? It could be positive or negative. Dominic? I can go. So I think for me, what was surprising was, um, you know, in my exploration of energy poverty and energy justice literature, um, there, like it, it started really like with this concept of fuel poverty in the United Kingdom, um, where Brenda Boardman and her like doctoral thesis was able to, you know, coin the term fuel poverty as this interplay of low incomes, high fuel costs and inefficiencies of a specific housing dwelling. And that work really, you know, like snowballed and picked up steam to help actually formally recognize fuel poverty in, um, you know, the developed nations of, of the UK. And from there, you know, like they've been able to actually um, come up with this measurement to say that anyone that spends more than 10% of their income on their energy bill is considered fuel poor. And while like they've transitioned to a new metric, this low income, high cost metric, um, I've been surprised to, you know, just like see how they've been able to actually like collect that data. I think one other thing, and so drawing a parallel from the UK to the US and like we don't have any form of recognition of that, that of course was like really surprising. Um, additionally, I think in some of my previous work looking at the spatial disparities of energy consumption and efficiency, um, seeing these hot spots of high energy consuming homes or highly energy inefficient homes in the city of Detroit that overlay with the households that have the lowest incomes that are primarily um, people of color, black and Latinx communities, um, you know, seem to draw along the contours of what um, previous redlining has had the effect of, you know, forcing homes to live in certain neighborhoods. Um, and so that old housing structure um, and, that has like, a, it has an effect on, um, you know, what people are, how people are consuming their energy in their homes now. And so I think that's something that's pretty interesting. Okay. Yeah, um, one thing that surprised me, it's a little bit a field of the climate issues, but when I was working at the California Public Utilities Commission, I worked on some utility shutoff work. And the thing that surprised me the most was um, how tied energy poverty is, or like the threat of shut off is to just a cascade of different negative outcomes in terms of people being worried that their children were gonna be taken by child protective services because they didn't have power. Just a, a variety of different unexpected outcomes that come from the threat of losing your power or that um, at least when I was researching this there, you could, if you could, didn't have your power on consistently, in Section 8 housing, you could lose your housing for that reason. So just so many different things tie into energy access that I was not previously aware of. Nice. Aaron, you want to add anything that I was going to ask you a follow-up question anyways? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll just be quick about this. I, I think something surprising, I, I, I know I've said it before, but it is really reaching out to those, those communities that we haven't been in, um, establishing those new relationships and um, ensuring that we can we can stay there for, for the long haul. And I mean, again, that's why we have the RFI out. Um, that's why we, we continue to work to figure out ways to solicit applications, lower barriers of entry, um, to really reach communities that we, we didn't even know, we may have not known that we're, that we're energy burdened or, or as disadvantaged, so. Yeah, we, we, I'm gonna combine a couple questions here that people have asked. This is for you, Aaron. Where else is ETIP working on projects? Is DOE working across all territories and possessions on energy planning as well as the states? So, um, I'll, so for the first question, ETIP itself, it, it's those 11 communities I had up on my slide. Um, that's just our first cohort. Uh, we're hoping to plan for other partnerships with other communities. Um, and that's Alaska, Maine, North Carolina, and Hawaii. Um, the, the initiative at the initiative level for the energy transitions initiative, we do, as I said, work with um, some, due to some dis disaster recovery work in Puerto Rico, US Virgin Islands, the Marriott Islands. Um, we're also working with uh, territories such as Guam. We've been uh, in discussions with, with 
another federal agency, EPA, about how we could improve our work in American Samoa. Um, and we're also exploring uh, ways to work with other communities within the continental U United States, but those are still to be determined, so I don't want to get too far into that. Um, what was the second question again? It was, is DOA working across all territories and possessions on energy planning as well as the state? I think you kind of answered that. Yeah, yeah. So short answer, yes. And um, I mean, it's not, it's not just us. It's a collaborative effort across DOE. Um, there's the Office of Indian Energy that's trying to uh, ramp up uh, work within um, amongst tribes. Um, there's the State Energy Office, uh, which works alongside the Weatherization Assistance Program to bring these energy efficiency solutions to the states. Um, there's the other programs that I mentioned on my slide, but certainly could go down the list, but those, those are some of the big hitters. Thanks for answering that. So we have an anonymous question. We heard some tech policy data and community engagement related solutions today. Does any one of these need to be prioritized first or is this all, all of the above all at once? We'd like to answer that. Nika, do you wanna answer that in thinking about California? Like are any, uh, when we think about wildfire and heat, what needs to be prior, prioritized first in, in your work? Um, yeah, I, I think it's hard to say that any one should be prioritized over the rest. I, I think that there's a, a natural, I think in policy making, there's a natural maybe emphasis more on tech or, or policy approaches, but it's so important to have community engagement because it's so easy to develop something that just misses the mark entirely with um, these very like localized issues. I mean, even, you know, there's a fire prone community in Butte County versus a fire prone community in um, you know, out the LA area just have different issues and different needs. And, and I think it's so important to, to really incorporate folks into those solutions. Yeah, Aaron, you're working across the country in the island state, island parts of the, our nation um, and territories. What are you seeing as like a common thread in these places? You know, what needs to be, do you see like one thing that needs to be done first in these kind of communities you're working in? Um. I mean, I, I sort of take it from my, I mean, my view would be more, we, it's an all of the above approach. We need to address um, these issues to really develop clean and sustainable energy. We need to think about our, like energy efficiency, renewable energy, um, sustainable transportation at, at once. We, we can't cherry pick and prioritize one over the other. For example, if you forego energy efficiency and just ramp up renewable energy investments, it's, it's a lot more expensive it, it, than if you decide to make energy efficiency investments first, lower the amount of uh, consumption, and then you'll need less renewable energy um, to serve that load. So we have a question from Brian. He says, should there be a energy program equivalent to WIC or SNAP to provide a base level of energy without fear or turn off of turnoff or disruption? Nika, you were nodding your head. Let's hear. I think so. I mean, I don't know how. This is not a UCS position. This is far field of what I work on on my in my day to day, you know, work. But just in my experience, when I was working at the Public Utilities Commission, I think that there's a real need for that, and that um, it would provide so many different health benefits and just well being benefits for folks in our state. That I, I think it's worthwhile and across the country. Um, I mean, there, it would be complicated. There would be lots of issues because, you know, at what point do you, you know, what's the base level? If you live in, you know, the Imperial Valley in California and it gets to 110 is the base level, does that include AC? I, maybe it should, maybe it shouldn't, you know, so that I think that's a very tricky place to go, but I feel like folks do deserve some base level of energy. Dominic, you want to add to that? Yeah, maybe a bit. I, I agree. I think there should be something that can support, you know, like the complete access for, for energy for those, especially who don't have it. But again, I agree with Nikkei, like it, it's complicated just given the, the landscape of our energy um, system and the terrain right now, especially with a sizable amount of um, energy utilities being investor-owned utilities. And so um, negotiating that relationship and again, like I think like what, what's the standard of energy and like how does that change across the country is, is really important to consider. 
Um, but I think it, it's worth to explore and to innovate. So we have a final anonymous question here. How should all of us act to address these issues and complexities? You know, that is as individuals, right? Because like climate change, energy, you know, their thing, energy, we all rely on it, right? In our daily lives and climate change is happening to everybody at different, in different ways. How, you know, I'm an individual, I'm here in San Francisco, how should I act? How, what, what can I do? I actually was joking with my husband, he's off today because he's a federal employee and just got Juneteenth off yesterday. So um, I was, he ran the dishwasher this morning. I was like, oh, you're helping California by running your dishwasher in the morning. So that kind of stuff helps. I mean, we, we are in the flex alert right now where we're telling you to shift your energy to certain times of the day. Obviously when those things happen, you should do that. Um, but I, I think honestly, the thing that people can do is get involved in you know, making a fuss about this, like make it known that you are upset that we are making these choices that people are, you know, I'm coming from California, so that people are like running from fires every year. Like you need to make it known that you are upset with that because us as in any one individual, you can do things that help, but really the best thing you can do is like lend your voice to a collective push to make this system more equitable. Yeah, Dominic, what do you, what do you wanna say about that? What can we do as individuals? I'm going to double down on that as well. I think, you know, like if you want to go fast, you go alone. Um, but if you want to go far, you go with other people. And again, like the power of organizing, the power of, you know, being mad about these things is, is really important. And so like get engaged with your local communities that are already doing this work, get engaged um, and, you know, learn how to um, really interact with your public utility commission. Like what does public commenting look like? Because a lot of times like these utility companies um, need approval for new infrastructure investments, um, new rates and things of that nature. And so if there's a way for us to, you know, really make it accessible for folks to be able to democratically engage as we do and we go to the polls and think about that on a smaller scale, I think that's really important. And maybe a final parting note I'll say about, I think just individually, um, like we all like have energy, we all have capacity and energy from like a very physics standpoint is like the capacity to do work. And so um, we have to choose like what work we want to do. Um, and people often conflate, conflate energy and power. And the difference is that power is actually the rate at which we use energy. And so if we want to kind of like take back our power or, you know, like collectively use our power, we need to figure out what work we're doing and over what time period. Thank you, Dominic. Aaron, last thoughts from about 30 seconds. Yeah, um, no, I, I think those were all great points. I, I want to double down on Nikkei's point about just energy conservation and uh, reducing consumption. I think that that would certainly go a long way to help, helping. Um, again, we need an all of the above approach, but um, one thing we as individuals can certainly undertake. It was really great to talk with you three and nice to have do this panel with Metcalf. We're going to toss this back to Sunshine with uh, with the Institute. Here you go. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so, so much for this incredible panel, um, Aaron and Nikkei and Dominic and Ezra for your fabulous moderating skills. Um, we really appreciate your insights and your time. And likewise, we appreciate uh, all of you who joined us today um, to take part in this conversation. And um, apropos of Nikkei's comment about uh, the Juneteenth holiday, I hope that you all have some time to, to reflect tomorrow and celebrate this, this new holiday. Uh, peace be with all of you as we do that. And thank you for joining us. We hope that we'll see you again another time. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks all. Thank you all.